Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Um, my name is John Besant and I'm involved with the uh, ISPIM Special Interest Group on Teaching and Coaching Innovation. And uh, what we really try and do in, in that group is build a community of practice. So very much a space where we can share ideas, share experiences, and hopefully share some useful tools or techniques as well, which nicely brings us on to today's topic. Uh, delighted to have Tony Morgan and Lena Jasperson um, to help with this webinar, um, uh, to help del to, to deliver this webinar. Um, but basically it's around a really important theme. Um, some of you may know, and if not, I'll put the commercial in now. Uh, ISPIM is involved in several uh, research projects, one of which has just come to an end and it was called Vision. And you can find lots of details on the ISPIM website. More importantly, you can download uh, an ebook for free, um, but uh, the Vision Project basically said, what will the future of teaching and coaching, innovation and entrepreneurship and creativity, what will that look like in, uh, uh, in 10 years time? And it was using a forecasting methodology and some fascinating workshops and took opinions from a lot of different people. Uh, yes, thank you, Lucia. She's put the link in the, the, the chat box for anyone who wants to follow it up. But the key thing about Vision was, what's our world of teaching and coaching going to look like 10 years from now. And of course, that instantly brings into the frame our students and where they go. And that whole question of uh, employability and the uh, things that the world outside is looking for, absolutely top of the list. And what they're looking for is flexibility, creativity, team working, problem solving, skills that you all understand and know about. But in a sense, it raises a big question for us. If that's what we're going to need and we're going to need more of it, how do we deliver it? And that's what I hope Tony and Yelena can help us with in their presentation today. So I'm going to shut up. Uh, we'll have a presentation for about 25, 30 minutes and then some space for questions and then uh, uh, some conversation around this really important topic. So no more from me, but welcome, everyone. And I'll hand over to you, Tony and Lena. Thank you very much. That's uh, brilliant, John. Thanks very much. So we'll do a quick introduction of ourselves first. Uh, my name is Tony Morgan. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Leeds in the UK, but my background is very much in industry. I spent uh, 30 years in IT and technology, 20 years at IBM, um, and a number of my final roles at IBM were focused on innovation. So I was the chief innovation officer for one of IBM's large business units in the UK and Ireland for a while across Europe. Um, but now I teach innovation, design thinking, innovation management, and emerging technologies at the University of Leeds, often with Lena. So over to you, Lena. Hello, my name is Lena Jesperson. I'm based at Leeds as well, um, where I'm a university academic fellow. And my research is mostly around collaborative research innovation. So when Tony joined our team, I was thrilled to kind of start working with him across this industry academia divide. Um, I'm also very much focused in my work on research methods. And I mean, looking at design thinking as bringing in new ideas for research development as well. Um, we, we, we have lots in common and yet come from different perspectives, which I think will also help with the talk today because I come from a more very narrow academic background in, that, in comparison to Tony. So, so that's great. So what we're gonna talk about is really our experience of needing to teaching innovation and design thinking and how that can aid student employability overall. So really matching what John was saying. And um, in my final years at IBM a number of years ago, uh, I was starting as part of my innovation role, training some of our graduates. And they would come in and they would have fantastic skills, let's say in computing or in business, but often they didn't have some of the wider skills that we really needed. And I was starting to train them in some of these skills. Uh, and I was very fortunate I had a visiting professorship sponsored by the Royal Academy of Technology at the uh, University of Leeds. And part of that was to create a new module. Um, but we wanted that to be interdisciplinary. So we were, we were going to create a new module focused on innovation. But I also was thinking about this employability skills gap. So the sort of things that I found in IBM, but also backed up by our research with the Royal Academy of Engineering, other graduate recruiters, academic and industry papers were people that can creatively solve problems, work effectively in teams, collaborate, collaborate with very diverse stakeholders, be able to really effectively communicate, being commercially aware, which can mean different things, but having commercial knowledge. And also this last one, I think is very interesting, um, being resilient, 
uh, when a problem happens, but also they can make change and innovation happen in their organizations. So that was very much we saw we saw the challenge that we were facing. Well, and as we look at this list of demands from um, from an employer perspective, we also know, of course, there are a variety of different skill areas that that actually play into this particular issue of employability. So um, it may be that we are all here particularly interested in innovation and, and design thinking to a degree, but at the same time, we all know there's lots of practical stuff that is important that we need to know as well. How do I run a really good team meeting, for example, yeah, or generally issues around collaboration. Um, an attitude as well that is set towards critical thinking and problem solving, and also a kind of development of personal growth and learning skills that, that help students to learn beyond uh, academia or university exposure. So I think um, with that in mind, we kind of translated the challenge into uh, the broader question of how we can actually teach what we teach, namely innovation and design thinking, but at the same time, also improve our students' employability, because just knowing about innovation technique by itself uh, is only so useful as these students hit the labor market. Today, we want to share a little bit what we've done in this area, addressing that particular question. Um, but up front, I would like to briefly explain that we worked on this question in three ways. So. Um, the first way um, was working on the particular module that Tony um, created initially during his visiting a professorship, and which until till, till then we in iterations developed further and improved further. Um, and as we delivered that over several years, uh, we learned a lot and gained a lot of new insights, which we then shared in a new textbook. Um, in part two, it's the students who want to learn those employability skills alongside innovation and design thinking, but in part also to assist colleagues who may be interested in um, having, having um, a, a, a similar module that, that, that has this more project-based approach. Um, and then finally, more recently, we've engaged in a pedagogical research project where we examine much more in deep the, how, we, how we learn within a project-based teaching. And we will talk a little bit about that as well, but mostly on the module today. That's great, Lena. And the, the module, we, we gave it this name, Innovation Thinking and Practice, uh, as Lena said, sort of created it during my visiting professorship. But now, despite my grey hair, I had a late career change and moved over from IBM to work at the university now. And uh, so the module started when I worked at IBM in my visiting professorship, but now it's been going for about five or six years and each year we evolve it. But the core of it is we centre it on team based projects. And each team is given a real world industry innovation challenge submitted by, but also developed with industry experts. So we sit down with people from uh, the United Nations Environment Programme or First Direct Bank in the UK or a local city council or a community interest company, um, an energy company, a retailer, whoever. But we try to have a range of local, national and international organisations across many industries. And each of these challenges then assigned to um, teams of interdisciplinary teams of students. I have a very long spreadsheet at the beginning of the semester with um, the students' details, which course they're in, their gender, um, UK, non-UK students, and we mix them up as much as we can. And we have teams of about six or seven students focused on the challenge. Uh, we use a, a whole set of innovation, innovation management and design thinking techniques to, to structure the, um, the project and also to aid with the, the students' learning. And one I'll particularly highlight, which I'll come back to later on, which we found really, really useful and interesting is the diverge converge approach, where you diverge in an activity. So all students provide their individual input and then you converge to use the power of the team. Uh, it, it's a core technique used in design thinking, but actually, I'll, as I talk about later on, in terms of diversity and inclusivity in education, it's a fantastic research and one uh, a topic and one we're doing more research in at the moment. So. So that's the sort of the, the sort of key points of the module, but how do we teach it and how do the students learn? Uh, we have a variety of um, aspects. Uh, before each weekly uh, workshop class, we have um, sort of 10 minutes, we call them online mini lectures, pre-recorded lecture about, in inverted commas, the theory area, innovation management or design thinking or communication skills and so on. Then the students come into the workshop, last two hours, we facilitate them, Typically, we have 10 teams of students working around a table with their own screen, as you can see uh, in the picture. Each workshop 
is at a set point in the innovation management process, uh, facilitated a series of activities, often design thinking activities, to progress their project. Also, then the students have out of class working, which is quite challenging with their timetables because they all work in different schools, have different timetables, but that's part of the experience of working in a team, being able to collaborate, communicate, work time management, and so on. We provide additional reading resources against each of the topics. And this really important point about industry expertise. So we have the industry experts who help design the challenges, but also at a point, early point in the project, the students um, interview those industry experts because that's a really good um, uh, communication technique and a collaboration technique. But also we have some short three to five minute um, selfie style videos of industry experts talking about uh, key uh, employability skills, which is one of our one of our resources. And we also bring uh, industry experts into the class. So a couple of weeks ago when we were doing prototyping, I had a couple of industry experts in. They would basically spend a little time, five or 10 minutes of each team, share their insights, ask the team what they're doing, answer questions. But it's a way of sort of embedding a whole range of industry expertise into the classroom. And the students are doing all this work, but it's really important to us that they actually think about what they're learning. So we do have weekly reflective journals to deepen the student learning and, and help them, we've called it surface their skills so that they understand, you know, I've done this thing, but I've learned from it. How can I apply it in future? And actually realizing they've got this. And one of the things we focus on as well is creating stories. So great stories they can use in their job interviews, for example, because we should have said these are final year undergraduate students. So it's a very important time, semester one, they're just going into their first job interviews or in semester two, they're having job interviews and assessment centers and so on. So, so that's, our, that's our approach. A little bit about the way the project works. And this is very much following a sort of three stage innovation management process of the first stage being idea generation and the challenge, the second stage being um, development, and the third stage being um, delivery. We don't go past the delivery piece because we get as far as the development and at the end they pitch to get investment. But we also follow very much the design thinking figure of eight. So the first half of the module, series of workshops and resources, first off about understanding the problem that they've got. And we have a catchphrase, fall in love with the problem, not the solution, which is one of our favorite phrases that we help the students. They identify and understand key stakeholders, particularly their end users, sponsors, but other stakeholders. We use design thinking techniques to help them generate and prioritize ideas. And then they go to the, you know, the the blue part of the loop around creating a very early prototype and at this stage maybe a paper prototype or something like that but in parallel thinking about their commercial value so that's if you like the first iteration of the project halfway through we're very very nasty people um, we say at the beginning of the, the session really enjoyed your work you're all doing well type thing um, but I've just had an email last night from all your project sponsors and funnily enough it all says the same thing we really like what you're doing, but please, can you change your idea? And we have lots of students with their arms crossed, looking quite angry in the room. And we say, what's wrong? And they say, well, I love our solution. And we say, well, don't forget, you must fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Innovation is iterative. But most importantly of all, this is how the world of work and the real world works. You have disappointments. and There are things you can't change. So we have a session about resilience, and we call it bounce back ability. And, and so the students are forced to either come up with a totally new idea or change the one they've got. But of course, in innovation, they're not throwing everything away because they've just spent half the time understanding lots about the problem, understanding lots about the stakeholders. So they've got great information they didn't have at the beginning. The second half of the module, we have a second iteration now where the students then work on a, their revised idea. They develop a prototype often a digital prototype, but it could be a physical prototype, it could be a process prototype, depends what type of solution uh, the students are generating, but also the commercial value. And then finally, they pitch their ideas at the end of the development stage um, to effectively a sponsor and investors. And um, we have senior people from industry and across the university come to these sessions. It's very good timing because um, we have one class presenting tomorrow afternoon and one class presenting Friday morning. So I'm very busy. We're very busy at the moment getting everything ready for that. But that's that's the structure of the module. Um, 
but uh, you know, there's other important things too, like assessment. Lena. Well, um, so far we have always given prizes for the best pitches judged by our Dragon's Den, um, as 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 well as the students themselves. Um, but so far we are not assessing the pitch presentation as such, despite a few students complaining about it. So at the current situation is we. We don't uh, mark this, but moving forward, we are thinking about doing this as we scale up the module, having large number of students. Uh, and part um, of that, it will be part of the accreditation that the business school and the university uses as well. So we're bringing that presentation aspect in. Exactly. Um, and also we have already a, a brilliant panel judging them. So why not also draw draw on, on, on this? Um, we then give students only 10% for the completion of their reflective journal as an incentive to actually do that. We also provide formative feedback on the reflective journals about halfway through, and we keep chasing them a little bit to kind of actually do those because these are really important so that they can then write their reflective essay on their experience of doing the project and what learning they've taken away at the very end. Um, and that is at the moment 90% of the grade, and it will be a bit less in future once we take into con consideration the uh, presentation as well. Um, both the reflective journals as well as the final report are structured. These are undergraded students, so we give them particular uh, areas around innovation skills, communication skills, commercial awareness, and we also help them a bit to learn the language of reflection and learning and how to document learning, um, which many students, particularly from engineering disciplines, for example, often are not really familiar with, and it's for them kind of a challenge in its own right. And, and that's right, and I think um, exactly what you say, you know, that the the, the presentation, sorry, the, assi the assignment paper itself, is a, it's writing a report, it's a communication skill. So that's part of the learning as well as what we assess on. Of course, as you can imagine, you've seen the picture of the students collaborating in this fancy classroom with the, with the, with the screens. Um, as COVID hit us, we had a problem. No? How can we do this project-based teaching in a, in a remote learning environment? Um, but we said we should kind of, you know, take our own medicine and we should think about this not primarily as a problem, but also as an opportunity. Um, so so we, we thought about how can we use this opportunity to help students learn uh, digital collaboration tools that in the workplace they will be using most likely at a later point anyways. Um, and we developed a combination of um, a collaboration platform called Miro. Some of you may know that or a similar one called Miro. Um, uh, which we could use um, alongside Zoom. So we had to kind of bring together elements within these bigger workshops, which, which we're all online now, where we had a more forum type of setup, um, also in the diverge moments, and we don't want them to talk anyways. We kind of often left them in the forum mode, um, but then put them into their breakout groups to do group work together using um, this um, uh, mural website as a, as, a, as a collaboration platform where they could document the work they were doing and which they could also use a bit like a flip chart, you know, with different post-its and things. I've added um, a picture of this um, on, the, on the screen. These two together worked very well. Of course, we saw a difference in terms of how students come together as a team as to whether they meet and have coffee or whether they only meet in a virtual environment, but it worked surprisingly well. So um, we kept using this approach um, because it enabled us a, a degree of hybrid teaching when we came first back in the classroom and we still had some of our students, in particular Chinese students, still not back in the, in the UK yet. Um, and now moving forward that we are back to, to teaching in the classroom, we are retaining, for example, Mural as a collaboration tool um, instead of using flip charts and posters like we did in the past. Um, yes, it's true, the haptic experience of doing stuff on, on paper is brilliant, but then again, the traceability and the ability to have all in one place for all students accessible at all times is, of course, also a massive benefit. And, and it's great. We can look on Mural and we say, you know, Team 3 has updated it one hour ago, Team 4 two, two, two hours ago, you know, four days after the workshop or something. So we can see that they're progressing their projects right, right through the week as well. And also during the class, it's much easier to see which team you should go to and talk to because you see them getting stuck sometimes. Uh, whereas, of course, in the classroom, when you circulate, it's sometimes harder to actually pick up on those things. And, and it's lovely because we have a collaborative classroom where each team can have their own screen, but we can display to all screens and we can pick up that, you know, 
team five have got a brilliant value proposition statement or a really good empathy map and then broadcast it so everybody can see. So it's really good for sharing examples as well. So some of the impacts, we'll, we'll, we'll get to sort of finishing talking about the module now, but um, some of the things that we've definitely seen, students are using these employability skills and their innovation skills to help them get jobs. Um, that's evidenced in the student reports um, when they're talking about how they've used the experience and the learning and, and, and so on, um, whether that's commercial awareness or collaboration skills or talking about a problem they've had in the team, how this helped them get a job. Uh, we have formal module evaluation feedback, which I'm sure you all do, um, who run courses, uh, and we get a lot in there as well. And we get we, we get a lot of feedback from our students as well. We have a LinkedIn alumni group, and, and we get a, a lot of great feedback. Um, some of the alumni tell us they introduced design thinking to their graduate employers. So I had one student asking me a few weeks ago saying, we're going to run our first design thinking session in my part of Oracle. Um, I'd like to use some of the things we did in the module. Can you share things? It was really good because I could give the resources that we created for the book. Um, uh, last week, I went to NHS Digital and did a two hour session for their um, graduate cohort this year because one of their previous one of our previous students has now joined and was speaking to their early careers people about there's this really good things that that you could you, you, you could we could learn from. So it's great to, to be able to take it from the classroom out into industry. We also know that some of our alumni are using design thinking when they're creating their own startups. Unimate and Calbot are two apps. If you <laughs> if you Google search them, you'll find them. But um, uh, and our students talk about how they use things like uh, empathy maps, thinking about stakeholders, um, some of the prototyping skills, and so on when they were creating their you know both their business, but also particularly the, the these are app based solutions they were looking at. The module was shortlisted last year in the Times Higher Education Award as Business School of the Year Award, um, the Leeds uh, entry. It's not just a business school module, it's very interdisciplinary. We have students from across the university, but it's based, we're based in the business school, so it's there. We made this, we made the top four or five because we were shortlisted and went to the event. Unfortunately, we didn't win the award, but it was really great to be recognized. The module is consistently oversubscribed and before we started, um, John Lena and I were having a great conversation about some of the challenges scaling up and some of the work that the ISPIM group are, are looking into that. And that's certainly something we'd like to get involved in, John, because that's a challenge that we've got. Um, with the changes of the university's curriculum uh, in Leeds over the next couple of years, we've been requested to effectively treble our capacity. So, um, so we're looking how we you know, we're looking how we can do that at the moment. So we'd certainly like to have a conversation at the second half about that as well. Uh, and just to, just to finish off, before we go into that second half, a couple of the other things that we're working on, uh, based upon the um, the module, we've started a project, we've given it a horrible long name, um, but let's just call it IDDES, or sounds like ideas a bit for short. It's focused on interdisciplinary teaching and um, things like enhancing employability skills. We're using the student journals and essays, um, the ones we've got ethics approval to use, so the students have to say that they've proved to use them fantastic set of um, data for us to do uh, qualitative research on uh, and we're using those also with interviews with our with our student alumni and what we found over the course of this project is our focus areas have evolved in the way the data is taking us so we've certainly got one focus area on interdisciplinary team-based teaching and learning um, I mentioned diverge and converge at the beginning that's something that actually the data has found some really rich things around about inc inclusivity. For example, students that um, may be more introverted, if they're having a group discussion, maybe they won't provide their ideas, they won't provide their inputs, they'll be dominant, conversation dominated by one or two more confident students. When we diverge, this has to be done in silence. Everybody has to provide their inputs and it's finding a voice for those um, uh, for, for those students who who were the, the the less talky ones, if you like, the more introverted ones, which is great. Similarly, for where English isn't the first language, it's allowing other students to participate, provide their inputs when sometimes they're not quite as confident as getting involved in that sort of dynamic conversation. So really interested in what we're finding on Diverge and Converge. Uh, Lena, you might want to talk about the other two areas. Yes, um, the other two areas are experience and reflection, because I think as Tony alluded to before, it's, it's important to reflect on what you learn, but also for students to be able to articulate that. And actually we see there a bigger variation in, 
in in the ability to kind of make use of that learning and understand what 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 you can do with it, um, then we may see in the actual acquisition of certain skills and techniques. So understanding how students vary in the learning experiences and outcome and the relative role of both experience and reflection, encouraged reflection, is is is, is something we are we are looking into at the moment. Um, and then finally, we have something we call for now transformational learning. And that comes back a lot to the uh, resilience session that Tony had mentioned before. Um, certain types of experiences, in particular that pushback experience, often uh, trigger in the reflective journal a much deeper reflection on what they have taken away as a person um, or how knowledge, skills, and attributes kind of come together and how they want to look look at their work or understand their work in a different way in the future, more generally, um, which is why I for now named the transformational learning. You can see how they really take a lot away from, from these experiences specifically. And again, we want to better understand what students do that and what students don't and what does it mean for, for, for them moving forward as we are also conducting these interviews with, with alumni. So do they actually take it away long term or not? Is of course a, a, a question that is, is very interesting to us. And we're due to complete the research sometime next year. So hopefully <laughs> we can uh, disseminate it to you all at the time. Um, the other thing which we've done as we progress with the module of iterations, getting more and more material and um, extra resources, we decided um, there is actually not a book that helps us to do just that, at least not one that kind of works specifically. Uh, for us. Um, and so we decided to write our own book and to kind of package the module to, to a de 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 degree to assist others, uh, colleagues who want to do this kind of project based teaching that they don't need to reinvent the rule and can 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 also use uh, some some of the materials we have already created. But we also made this a very student facing, very engaging book so that students, if they want to, can also use it in teams or in groups. Um, to 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 learn about employability and um, and the design thinking themselves. Um, there was a massive effort putting this together, but we think um, it it really paid off, and we do hope that maybe some of you want to have to have a look at this as well and find it yeah. useful. There are accompanying resources both for students, like lots of design thinking templates, a mural template, you know, additional guidance on how to run meetings, all of these kind of things. Um, as well as additional resources for academics interested in, in doing this kind of teaching, providing, you know, a little handbook and additional guidance, how to kind of run these online meetings, experiences we've made, what works, what doesn't, um, just to kind of, um, yeah, share, share our insights as much as possible there. And we tried to design that in such a way that if somebody was creating a new module and wanted to use the whole thing, that's fine, but we think more often than not, it'll be improving or creating parts, so we tried to make it very modular as well. So um, when we, just the last thing we thought we'd mention, it, we had to take our own medicine when we were writing the book. So it's about design thinking and, and projects. So we use design thinking to engage students to understand what they want and need from a new textbook. Uh, and interestingly, we actually had students do our illustrations. So you can see on the top right, there's a different view of the figure of eight um, design thinking. We had a competition in Leeds um, for students for illustrations. And we got two fantastic illustrators for the book from our students. But we use design thinking with our students and from students um, elsewhere. So we run a number of sessions um, asking them, creating empathy maps, personas about students, but also idea sessions and idea prioritization. So a diverge and a converge again, generate as many diverse ideas as you can and then converge so we could review them to see which, which would have most impact. And then we reviewed the feasibility with the publisher of what we could get into the book. So the sort of things we came up with were the students said, lots of textbooks we don't read, we scan read them, we try to pick out the key points. So make it easier for us to find where the key points are. So we've color coded certain sections. Um, they said, we want interviews, not just hear from you, we want diverse people from industry and academia. So we have some really great uh, expert interviews, people like Doug Dietz, my design thinking hero, does the MRI scanner story. Um, you see the picture at the bottom, uh, one of our fantastic startups in Leeds, um, Vet AI, uh, sort of talking about pitching. Um, and you can see there's that sort of faint orange colour. So that's one of the colour coding. Those, those expert interviews are all colour coding. Uh, students ask for QR codes so they could very quickly scan their phone in and, and go off to a resource. They said, we want some space for notes and reflections to make our notes. If we're buying the physical, some of us will use the ebook, but if we're buying the physical book, we want to write stuff down in it. 
Um, so we had a discussion with the publisher because we thought they wouldn't let us have enough free space, but they did, which was great. So there is some space in there for notes and reflections, consistent layouts, examples, highlighting key points, summary pages, lots and lots of things that our students said they want in a textbook, which we got from them um, as we were writing it, which was great. And lastly, they also said, can we have a LinkedIn community? So it was actually the students' idea. So we, I mentioned the LinkedIn community for our module alumni before, but we also have a dedicated LinkedIn community for the book, which we've got a number of, it's just starting growing because the book's out, but we've got a number of academics, a number of students who've joined. Um, so, so that's really nice. As that gets going, we want to make that much more interactive. So, But that, again, came from students saying, wouldn't it be great if we, we could contact other students and other academics about the content? So that's our talking bit over. Um, we'll take a breath, uh, maybe five minutes or so for questions. And then the second half, we'd like to sort of engage everybody else and get everybody else's input and things as well. So thank you very much, John. I, I haven't been monitoring the chat because I've been talking. I'm not sure if we've got any questions yet or. Uh, no, we haven't yet, but I think this is a great opportunity to prompt people. Um, if you have a question or a comment, uh, anything on this really stimulating presentation, um, uh, do stick it in the chat and we'll try and pick it up. Um, but maybe I could start off uh, just by throwing one back at you, which you know, I've, I've, so many bells are ringing for me. But uh, uh, can you give us a couple of examples of the challenges that students work on? Yeah, sure. So I, I can give you a couple of the ones we've got um, this year. Uh, one thing I should say about the challenges, we always anonymize them. So we don't have any problems with intellectual property or large companies saying, well, you can't talk about this. So even though, so let's say it's first direct bank, we would call it second bank or something like that. So we always give it a different name. Um, so we've got really interesting NHS one this year, which is for the UK people, um, very, very relevant about um, problems with social care. So if somebody's on a social care plan, they live at home, they go into hospital, the social care provider probably doesn't find out that they've gone into hospital. Um, so if they had a fall and gone into hospital, they come around the house looking for the person, can't find the person. Equally, when um, the person's ready to come out of hospital, there are delays, we call it bed blocking in the UK, with um, being able to link to social care to get the care plan in place to help um, go, out, go out. So that's one challenge we've had this year, a healthcare challenge that the, the NHS have given us. And the challenge is we quite make them quite deliberately quite wide ranging so the, the students can go off in different directions on the challenge. And we have two teams for each challenge. So often the company will get two very different ideas. Um, another one we've got this year is um, from, from a, bank, a leading bank. How can they engage more young, younger people? So how can they sort of grow their business by engaging more younger people? perfect people to do it, university students, because often if you take a bank on when you're in, in university, you stay with it. So, so, so a great one. Uh, another really good one from a retailer, which is the world is changing. Some of our stores are located small shops around petrol stations. There will no longer be petrol and diesel in future. There will be electric cars with charging stations. How do we repurpose the station and the shop? So those are just some of the examples. So they're, they're always quite wide ranging, John. I that's, think that's what a, carry on, maybe useful to hear to us as well that we do not pick the students for a challenge. So we have a diverse team with all sorts of disciplines and they just get a, assigned a challenge. So we don't say, you know, these people do help and therefore they get the healthcare challenge. Um, and of course, they are assigned to challenges. So in the beginning, we always have a couple of students who would have preferred to work on a different challenge, but that's life. They are, they are kind of stuck with that challenge. Having two teams work on the same challenge is really useful because it means also throughout the process, these teams can pitch to each other um, and understand and ask questions. And therefore, um, it is um, very practical to do to, to actually have it structured in this way. That's lovely. Uh, right. Thanks for that. And, and, and I guess I'm going to steal uh, a, a little supplementary um, while there's a chance for people to put their questions in the chat box. But um, it sounds as if you've done a great job on the student engagement side. Um, but clearly, this all depends on engaging the world outside in delivering the challenges. So could you just comment a bit on how you get the challenges, how you source the challenges? Yeah, so there's a, there's a, a variety of ways. And actually, it was one of the conversations I was having last week with a few other people in the university about how we become smarter across the university in doing it and, and use the best practice from each other. But we use it from a number of ways. We have some direct contacts. Um, 
we have some groups in the university. One is we have something called the Nexus Innovation Center. Um, and that's a partnership with industry that's bringing industry in the university and the university to industry. So we always get some of their partners. We have another group in the university called the Future Fashion Factory, which is all about textiles and Yorkshire being a large textile area. We always use them to get some 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 partners in as well. Um, we also sometimes post on LinkedIn. This is the project. Um, this is the module this year. And we get various people. So we don't have one route, John. We have a number of routes. Um, what we try to do is we've got I think we've got two people that have been from the beginning that a lot of people want to stay. But we've had two I think we've kept from the beginning. We always try to vary some in and some out to, to get a bit of, you know, the sort of uh, new things and evolving things. But yeah, a, a variety of ways of getting the organizations involved. But it's definitely something that I think across the university and across universities, we, we could look at sharing best practices. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. And, and, and that, that's, uh, that, that certainly speaks to a, a big challenge, which is how, and it came up very much in the vision thing, how we really bridge this divide between our academic or our teaching world and the world of practice. And it sounds like yeah. you've got to address that both ways. And, um, and we've written a blog very recently about engaging industry. And one of the things I didn't mention in my answer, we have something in the business school called Leaders of Residence, which I, I was actually one of them when I, was, uh, when I worked um, at IBM. And these are people from industry that come into the university two or three times a year as part of different university modules from across lots of different industries that engage students. And they've also been a great source um, for us. Uh, for example, those I talked about the short, sharp sort of selfie lectures, sort of not lectures, but talks about key skills. We've got a, a number of those industry people to do that. So, so again, that's a great body that we use in the university. I see we're getting some questions in the chat. Shall yeah. I? Yeah. I was going to say you, you can probably see them, but uh, we've obviously yeah. got uh, quite a lot of interest stirred up in Ireland. Uh, uh, Lawrence and, and, and Peter, I noticed, are there. Um, Perhaps we could start taking those questions. Um, Perfect. Pick so, them up and perhaps yeah, so I can see Lawrence. I can see the chat. Now. Lawrence's question um, in managing teams from cross disciplines, business, engineering, etc. Did you come up with any solutions for facilitating engagement, such as VLE platforms, common timetable slots, etc.? Very interesting question, Lawrence, because that's part of our current research about how we can do that more effectively. Um, our initial view. Um, rightly or wrongly, was that's part of the student's challenge to work out. So that's part of their learning. We've said you can use whatever collaboration. So we give them some collaboration tools they can use that are part of our VLE platform. But we also say you can use whatever you like. So if you all use WhatsApp, that's fine. If you but but you must all have access and you must all be happy that you use the same tool. You can't leave somebody out. Um, in terms of timetables, that's a challenge which we're looking at. But I think Lena's got a point as well. Yes, and one other thing which we do in the first week, um, we ask them to do um, well, an ad hoc little video about their team with the name of their team and how they want to collaborate. Um, and this kind of makes them work together, but also helps to really announce we're going to use WhatsApp or we're going to use this other platform. And therefore, in case there is someone who isn't involved or who's not, not happy with it, it, it would come out very quickly in this way. So that exercise also helps with the initial steps of getting them to kind of talk to each other. Yeah, great. I, I hope that helps. Um, I hope that helps, Lawrence. But we're we're that's actually one of our research focus areas. So we'll we'll publish something on that um, at one level or another um, next year, hopefully. But it's definitely a challenge. The timetable one is is a key challenge. Um, uh, Sanya or Sanja has put a point about um, I've got a new module coming out and uh, a copy of the book. Uh, Sanja, I made a note of your name, but there's probably something we'll cover outside. But maybe you can connect with us on LinkedIn or something like that, and then we'll make sure you get all the right links. But we, we'd love it if you use the book. And if there's any questions you have, just let us know. Um, Peter's got a question. Um, how do you facilitate your students doing customer closeness observation ethnography without slowing down things with ethics forms and bureaucracy? What a Can brilliant I question, Peter. Something about that, Tony. Yeah. Um, given that I'm doing the research ethics type of side of things. Um, given the time frame we have, and at the moment it's not even a 20 credit module, we don't do observations. Um, in part because of this issue, but in part also because of the time frame. We have the students interview the expert. That is relatively easy to cover um, in terms of um, ethics at the university level. 
um, but we don't do formal observations. What we do encourage them, of course, is use opportunities on the internet to kind of do additional research and we help them structure their research um, based on, 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 on reading and using, using existing material. And we do a lot around the empathy maps. So we basically, um, and, and encourage them really to think through the problem from the perspective of a user. And in an ideal world, they would have more time to actually talk to the yeah. user or observe the user. Um, but generally speaking, that's very difficult to facilitate, um, not just because of ethics, but also because of the time we've got. In particular, if you want to do two iterations, we need to kind of push them a bit in the beginning. Yeah, so there's a limit we, we, we do with that, Peter. Obviously, it's not a full dissertation type project where you absolutely need to go through the ethics. So, so that's a great answer. I, mean, I hope, hope, hope that helped, that's helped, Peter. I've, we've got a great question from Lokesh. Um, so I'll read these out just for the recording. Um, uh, most of the real business examples from Western developed countries in most of the books, mostly force fitted or old innovation stories to design thinking framework, which drives lesser inspiration. How can we inspire students from real outcomes by applying design thinking frameworks and cases from Asia and I'd say the rest of the world as well? So I'll cover one thing, Lena, and then maybe you, you, cover, you, you cover the other. So when we were online, we took the advantage um, through some of Lena's contacts of engaging more globally. We had the United Nations Environment Programme talking about sustainable transport in Kenya as an African example. But I know Lena's done projects in India as well. So Lena, did you want to share the project, the design thinking project you did in India? Yes, um, that was more um, around um, community-based care for people um, with various issues where you have a collaboration issue between NGOs and, and, and formal healthcare provision. But I think the main point is for us, because we have very interdisciplinary groups, also from terms of not just academic discipline, but also international groups. So usually we have uh, students from abroad in each and every team, several of them. We do actually get a lot of examples and ideas that come from, from, from China and other places. Um, the other thing I think we need to consider here is um, what can students imagine? So for example, the Africa Sustainable Transport Challenge, it was particularly difficult we found because um, for some students, it was much harder to have empathy with a low resource environment in some kind of Kenyan village and really because understanding they... the kind of constraints that, that are operating in this environment. Uh, having said that, they came up with really interesting solutions and I think they learned maybe even more than some of their peers uh, doing British examples. So it is a question of mixing up, but also having the right experts, having someone who can really help them to um, look at problems in, 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 in environments these students are not familiar with and design thinking in particular with you know empathy maps with kind of see, seeing through challenges in a, in a specific way um, I think are brilliant to help um, students in both di directions to actually understand the issues at stake in a, in a, in a, in a more creative and also more empathetic way. Uh, and I've got a lovely example from a few weeks ago when um, uh, a Chinese student came up to me and said, so the challenge their team have got is from a consultancy company that's about hybrid working. So post COVID, lots of their staff want to work at home now, for example, in the UK, but they would like to get them more in the office. They think they're more productive. How can they balance this sort of hybrid working world? And so they said, we want to give staff, um, you know, the option to do things um, and, and work off, be proactive themselves. And this Chinese student came to me, my team is having this discussion, but I'm struggling because this doesn't work in my culture. We get, we don't get the option to do something. We get told to do something. And we had a really long, a really powerful, long discussion. And I said, the fantastic thing that you've got is you've got insights and thinking and ideas that the rest of your team won't be thinking about at all because they're not thinking about those constraints. So she went back and she had that conversation with the team and the ideas they came back with mixed those different diverse viewpoints, which was absolutely fantastic to see them doing it. So I think that, you know, that diversity is really good. But Lokesh, I'm not sure if we've fully answered your question, but I think one thing that we all need to do is come up with the design thinking stories and examples that are not just Western country based. So, you know, that are in the other countries as well, which are fantastic. And one of the, I'll just finish off because so we can go to more questions, but 
I, I've also Goldman Sachs run a 10,000 women program where they're they're engaging uh, w women in in, in particularly in developing not only but in developing countries who are starting their own businesses and things. I've run a few design thinking sessions for, for them, and it was fantastic. I ran a couple of sessions a couple of years ago, and then we had a face to face session um, in, in London. It was at the end of the last year, the beginning of this year. Uh, and this one lady came to me and she said, "Tony, I took away what you were saying in the session." And actually, I've been using it now with my customers who who buy my things, and it's really made a huge difference. And she had a lovely story about how she'd applied elements of design thinking in her own business, based upon you know one online session we had. So, so I think you're right, Lakesh. But I think it's on its own is on us all to create these examples. Um, Hassan's uh, question. So Hassan says, I teach innovation to my undergraduate students. Brilliant. Uh, usually in my class, I have a combination of business and engineering students who have two very different perspectives on a topic. What is your suggestion for engaging these two different groups? What a great question. Uh, and our core um, students are business school and computing students. And then we have lots of other students who come from elsewhere in the university. So we have sort of three key lots. Absolutely, we see sometimes a difference between the computing and the engineering, um, the business school students. Other times we need to be careful, I think, we, and I'm sure you're not, Hassan, by the way, but I, we need to be careful we don't stereotype as well, because those students are quite diverse in themselves from each, each group. But Lena mentioned the um, ice breaking video they make, which we tried to make the tell them to use humor and they get to know each other and and, and that really helps. But I think also the diversity of the teams helps in the, coming with these different skills. And we give them freedom, for example, again, this is an area our research is looking into, but if they were doing something to say, okay, our computing students are gonna do this bit, our business school students are gonna do that bit. I'm just going through the research. I've been you know, reading all the detailed papers at the moment uh, as part of the research. And what we're finding are there are different models. Some teams are absolutely doing that. They're doing a specialization division of labor. Other teams are saying, actually, I'm a business school student, but I want to learn about prototyping. So I would like to work with one of the computing students on prototyping and a computing student saying, I've never developed a business case. I would like to work on developing the business case. And, and so we're seeing a whole mixture of how teams are working and we're, we're trying not to constrain them. We're saying, it's your team. We'll give you some guidance, but part of this is being proactive and showing you initiative. Um, so we're seeing these different models. So in a way, our suggestion, Hassan, is have an ice-breaking activity for them to get to know each other better. And then our second suggestion is maybe you give them options, but also you give them some freedom, you know, clarity in what they need to do, but some freedom, I think, is a good thing in the way they, they, they do it. Hopefully that makes sense. If, if I may add, I think this is also very important to bring the reflection in here in terms of how we want to learn and what do I take away and and, and how do I engage with others. Um, I think a lot of the learning around working with people from other disciplines actually happens as they write their weekly reports and you can see how they're built on this week by week. Um, so why we haven't done a fully kind of um, panel long long term analysis um, from on 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 this topic yet just just from from reading the weekly reviews over the years I would like to add this as a as a comment I think the reflection element is key because they recognize issues whilst they are writing the report and that helps them also moving forward to gain later clarity in terms of what they are doing. Uh, that's a great point, Lena. And something we we should say as well that we stress to students. Um, that you can have a problem in your team and that's probably a good thing because you're going to learn from those problems in your team. So if you, um, it's not, I, I'm, this year actually we've put in some new resources to help students. If you have got some problems, here's some resources you can use. Um, but having a problem is not necessarily a bad thing because virtually all teams in the workplace, we all work in teams, we all know we have problems. Um, it's how they overcome those problems. And, and as Lena says, the reflections on some of, some of that is really important. We also say, if you consider your project and your presentation was a great success, that's great. If you consider your project and or your presentation was a failure, that's absolutely fine. Because what we want you to write in your assignment paper is what you describe in your experience and what you've learned from that experience and what you can do differently in the future. 
So the least successful, uh, a student writing about the least successful project can get as good, if not better mark than the student that says our project was perfect, everything worked perfectly from day one. And I think we all know from an innovation point of view on, on this call, that a lot of the learning and innovation is comes from failures and problems. So we're absolutely focused that side of things as well. Uh, that was quite a long answer in different directions, Hassan, to your question, but I, I hope it was good. I see we've got another question now from, from Meda. Um, you mentioned icebreaking activities to get students to know each other. Would you recommend any that are really efficient? Uh, Lena, do you want to chip in on that one? I think we trial different ones. And obviously, when you kind of Google online, you will find lots of different examples from, you know, sitting in the bus and talking about breakfast to all the all the all the way down to what we are mostly doing now is this little video piece. Um, because I think the video introduction helps us also to see where students don't come together or don't communicate or where one is excluded at a very early stage already, week one, week two, so that we have all the opportunity in the world to see what's going on and, and assist the, the process in this particular team a little bit more. Um, so I think what we also see from our research is that students collaborate better if they have a chance to meet physically in a space. Yeah. They can do it also all remotely. Um, it's possible, absolutely. But it takes longer for them to develop a sense of, of a group or of cohesion. And for the more, more shy ones or the, the ones with language issues, it is harder if they only meet um, online. Yeah. So I think bearing these two things in mind, can you give them an opportunity to actually meet for whatever reason? <laughs> and second, um, can you uh, encourage them to 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 do something together like the silly little video um, that um, also allows them to ex exchange a little bit who they are and how they want to work together and have a conversation with a purpose, namely that they have to deliver this assignment. Yeah, and as Lena says, that video gives us something as well, because we can see the teams that immediately got a great dynamic on. They're having a bit of fun. They put some credits and music. Maybe they're even dancing like a, a TikTok type video or whatever. Um, and we say, we you know, we encourage humor in those videos. So that, that, that's one of the things we use. We're always, I think we're all constrained for time and resources and things as well, but that's worked really well. And with those videos, we play them. They don't know we're going to do it, but we play them as they come into the class ne the next week. So um, the videos are all on. And you see lots of smiling um, for the team seeing, seeing their own videos or, or cringing sometimes as well. So hopefully that helps uh, better. For the whole cohort, I think hopes and fears has also been proven to be a very useful thing to do up front. So really to ask students quite upfront about what do they expect and what they hope to achieve and by attending this module and what they kind of be anxious about and to and to collect this on one big mural or one big spreadsheet and to talk through it and have a discussion around it, because at least it helps students then to kind of show uh, a bit weary about this and that helps also in the in the group dynamics later. Yeah, we've got another question. It's great. There's so many questions. I love discussion and things like this as well. Um, uh, Lokesh um, is asking, what are your thoughts on opportunities for design thinking to become the, the next Six Sigma in the industry for business excellence and growth? I'm can I take that one, Lena? I'm going to give you a very honest answer, Lokesh. I think design thinking is great, but I think the a good innovation person has a huge kit bag of tools and techniques and they dip their hand in and pick the right ones out for each specific context and each project and each group and stakeholders you're working with. So I don't think design thinking is the complete answer to most things. If I'm ever doing design thinking and I'm pulling in commercial things, I might be using the six thinking hats, lots of other, lots of other tools and techniques. Um, so I, I personally, I'm not a great believer in you know the, 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 the silver bullet type of approach. I think Six Sigma has some great things in. Agile has some great things in. Design thinking has some really great things in. Lots of other things do. My personal view is we put them all in our big kit bag and we pull the things out that we need for the right context, which needs time and experience to, to work out the right context and things. But that's my personal view anyway. John, I don't know if you might want to have chip in on that one. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess uh, I've been in the game long enough to see the rise and then the disappearance of several of these. I think you're right. It, it, it is a matter of a portfolio. Um, it's different things for different purposes. I think what design thinking really brings, um, and particularly through some of the techniques you've been talking about, really brings in a very visceral way, is an understanding of the user. We talk about users, but we don't always really understand them. And I think... Uh, this design thinking approach, the empathy idea is really important. Um, 
for me, I'm background in manufacturing, lean Six Sigma is absolutely essential, the, 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 the kind of disciplined approach. They're not mutually opposing. We need more of these. So I absolutely agree. And uh, I'll, 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 the design thinking one, the, we always make sure that um, when the students are using the design thing, they give their end users a name. So it's Dave or Sarah or Jane or whatever. Um, Doug Dietz, who we interviewed for the book, does this fantastic story. He, he, it's a great MRI scanner story, which I absolutely love and I always use. But he's got another great story about a project where they were working, nurses were the end users. And there was a, one of the users that was spending a lot of time with the project was called Sue. But she couldn't always, obviously, be with the project team. But whenever they had an important meeting or a decision to make, they had created a cardboard cutout with Sue written on it. And if they had a meeting, they were, Sue had a place at the table. And if they had an important decision or discussion, they'd all turn and they said, what would Nurse Sue say? And it was just their way of making sure they never, ever, ever forgot about the needs and the thinking of that end user, which I think is a lovely story. That, um, that is a, a, a lovely point. And, and I think it... Uh, uh, it comes through in what you've both been talking about, that clearly your students are getting a, a very direct experience of a real world, which they're shortly going to be employed in, but understanding it not in terms of departments or other structures, but it's made up of people. Um, and it, it, it sounds as if the model's working. Um, I've got an eye on the clock. If there is another quick question from somebody, we have a chance perhaps to squeeze one more in, um, but it'd be quick. And whilst you're thinking to get to that finish line, I'll throw my last one in. Um, this is really important. This came through in the vision project, how particularly we mobilize diversity in students across different faculties and so on, the way you've described. Um, how, in, in terms of scaling, is there an upper limit? How many of these could you handle? How might you scale it? Yeah, so that's what we're designing at the moment. For the, We've got a couple of years to do it, which is nice. So we're going to do some steps. But currently we have two classes. of Each class has 70 students, 10 teams with seven students in. Um, we're being asked, So we've got 140. We've been asked to do over 400. So we're looking to see how we have more classes. But in the ways we can re redesign this, maybe we have four teams for each challenge or, or, or something, because we're obviously going to scale up the industry challenges as well. So don't have the full answer for that at the moment. Um, John, that's something we're definitely working through. And again, we'd love to you know, work, work with the with yourselves and the team look, who were looking into this thing and share our own insights. But also, I think the key thing for us is learning from everybody else as well, because you know we're not the only people who are doing interesting things like this. We want to learn as much from other people as, you know, as well. So we'd love to be involved in that. Well, that's lovely. And many thanks for that. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, it is all about a community of practice. I think the, the quality of interchange we've had has been really good already, and there's much more to come. Um, I guess my final observation is that uh, when I was an engineer studying years ago, I wish this course existed because I had <laughs> my way through it to Harvard. But lovely stuff. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, I know a, a lot of people would be interested to know more. So if you could share the links, and I'm sure Lucia can help distribute them so that people can find out more. Uh, and let's keep the conversation going. But Absolutely. I guess I've got to put my process hat on. Um, we probably should draw to a close because people have other courses and other things to do. Uh, but thank you so much, Lena and Peter uh, and Tony. That's really been helpful.